Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Now, before I went into the different Fabians, I realised I have not done an history of the Fae. And I've dug out old paperwork in which um, I rewrote of family notes. But then I decided to go further into detail with this, looking through different books of my nan's, various notes of my nan's, and I've got a general selection of notes now to tell you what I was told, basically, stories I was told, <clears throat> etc. Excuse me. So, let's get into fairies through the ages. Remember, these are family beliefs rather than everyone's belief, but they're also rooted in history. They can be searched and found. So, it's not just fairy tale to speak. <laughs> so, the ancient people would pay homage to earth and nature spirits that lived all around them. Over time, they developed a belief that earlier gods connected with agriculture and growth became regarded as fairies, not so connected with the archaic deities, but seen as direct descendants of the nature spirits of wells, trees, rivers, etc. The medieval era, 300 to 1300 CE, established what we know today of fairies. A tradition developed in Britain during the late Middle Ages, especially during the 14th century, and the process itself was largely complete by the 15th century, it is believed. And um, process, I mean, is the development of the fae and the various stories. Obviously, there's many different beliefs in the fae, so the church would recognise the fae or the belief of fae as a vestige of pagan. And during the re Reformation, if you believed in fairies or had anything to do with fairies, then you were accused of witchcraft. The term fairy itself came to Britain from France um, in later Middle Ages. Beings that were in the fairy category, category were previously known as elves. They were feared they could afflict humans and animals. But there were also seductive females, many seductive females. It's also believed that even though there was no evidence of supernatural powers uh, for humans, the associations of fae include them to have a connection to divine beings or prophets of their time, descendants of their time, so to speak. Between 1100 and 1250, there were a number of romances written, and these featured encounters between humans and human-like beings who had luxurious lifestyles and special powers. They act as a lover, counsellors and protectors for the human knights, and sometimes as predators. These beings are usually described in detail, but are simply assumed to be mysterious. At other times, it is stated that they are human beings who have learned magic and sometimes they appear essentially to be superhuman. There are many accounts of people trying to check the veracity of fairy stories. The Jersey poet Wiss is famous for his visit to the enchanted Breton forest of Brokelande in the mid 12th century to find out about the stone. This was the stone of Barrington, and apparently when you splashed water upon the stone, it made it rain. Two well-known bits of fairy lore from, this, from the Arthurian cycle. One concerns the ancestry of Arthur's prophet. Arthur's prophet, as we know, is Merlin. In Historia Regum Britanniae, or Britanniae, History of Kings of Britain, Geoffrey of Monmouth told the story of how Merlin's mother was visited in her convent by a being in the form of a handsome young man 
or could appear and disappear at will. Although he is characterised as a demon, the story reads exactly like one of the stories of the invisible male fairy lovers. Arthur was generally believed to have been taken away to the Isle of Avalon by ladies, described by the poet Leoman as the fairest of all elves and so saved from death. Geoffrey of Monmouth, it's pronounced a few ways, so it's, um, there's some texts that pronounce it Geoffrey of Monmouth, Geoffrey of Monmouth, Geoffrey of Monmouth, it's, it's weird, I don't know why they do that, there is real, really no reason to do that, but that's how it's done, so that's how I have to read it, obviously, I don't want to get confused and see a different reading and think it's not the same, because it is. The components of fairy law, um, there are main components to the whole law um, and several motifs were enduring, might I add. So the first one is that there is a belief in a par parallel world to the human. So they inhabit their own world, they have their own ruler, they are long lived and sometimes even superior to us. The other one is the ability of their beings to enter our world and to enter their world. They can steal children of our world. And there's also a chance that humans could end up in their realm. Another part of a component is that they're beautiful supernatural women who dance in secluded areas at night and who can woo mortal men or abduct mortal men. They will not uh, marry, though. They will not marry. There is also the other that takes form of a man that will have sex with a woman. And this one usually finds them turning into monsters at some part in the tale. Very, very different. They are associated usually with the colour green. And when I say the colour green, I mean green, grey, green... Green in general, as such nature spirits, you would expect them to blend in. They can give blessings, but they can also afflict people. And these elements all seem to have been in place by the start of the 13th century. And it's important to remember that fairy lore and folklore tales were mainly passed through tradition of mouth. They were orally told rather than wrote down. 13th century, one of the earliest mentions of fairies is in the writings of Gervasi of Tilbury, 1150-1228, who compiled a compendium of hundreds of stories about the unexplained marvels of the natural world. Recreation for an emperor courtier was written between 1210 and 1214, and in there are the first illustrations, well, earliest mentions of fear so it says we don't know that for definite obviously this is just it's a more of a history type um more of a history information i guess by the middle of the 13th century english sources contain native traditions of elves as blighting and perhaps as healing and being seductive beings an international and this is like all over literally it was changed um they would be beautiful wealthy powerful fairies, and then there was a third kind of category that were creatures overlapping the first two types but did not fit into either so there was three types there was your elven ones that were healing um seductive they could also be quite uh, vicious and then there's the beautiful women that were wealthy and powerful and then there's a third category which were more of a creature type being that was in the 13th century of course by the end of the 13th century moves were made to put a systematic structure into the fae categories which means they would define what the fae were um as we you know the elven the elven people of 
Elvish, there's many different ways of pronouncing it, um, was legendary to the South, South England, Middle England text. Um, and this is describing the Elven as former angels banished to Earth for remaining neutral during the war in Heaven, which ended in the expulsion of the rebel angels to Hell. There, they took the shape of beautiful women who danced and played in secluded places with men, having sex with them at their peril. And it's very important to understand that um, there was a lot of that involved throughout history. The whole idea of the fairy tales that we have today are completely different. So there's a lot of um, sexual references in early fairy tales. The Chronicle of Robert of Gloucester, I can't pronounce that word, mid 13th century, spoke of Elvine, which is Elven, or, you know, it changes, as spirits often seen in wild places in the form of men and women who seduced humans. So there was a whole big thing about them being able to show themselves as pretty and you know, being completely different, I suppose, in a way that you're looking at an incubus, succubus type being. By the middle of the 13th century, um, they'd started putting them into categories, is what I'm trying to get at. And then came the systematic category structure in which we see today of the various fear out there. Before that, you need to remember that it was just three categories, which were the elves, um, the powerful women and the demonic creature type. Before that, it was just elves and dwarves, so it's changed. Um, early 14th century, um, it's when well, this is where a different sort of writing comes into form, and then it becomes widespread that they were devilish illusion, um, but they would take the form of beautiful women. Um, this is a manual that's called Fasciculus Morum, and it had elves in there, but they were very demonic, elvish type beings, very different to what's perceived now. And it's believed they could carry humans off to their own land where the heroes of the past dwelt. If we go to romances in general, some of the first English romances, they had influences that would provide the framework for systemising the fate. Sir Orfeo, this is C 1300, there's an example of a retold ancient tale that Sir Orfeo had to retrieve his wife from Hades. Will that change to him retrieving his wife from Hades? Fairy land. When we look at the medieval um, sort of era, um, these late medieval, I guess, and early modern periods, there were many references that continue to them being supernatural beings. The Puck was known in um, Anglo-Saxon times as a spirit who had nocturnal, um, there was basically nocturnal wars. And it was more of, it sent people into pitfalls like miners and such, and it caused chaos and destruction. While later on, it was featured in the Middle Ages that even though they were an entity of the night, they were not evil. Or so it, it's very, very varied and different. By the time we get to 14th century, this is when the name Goblin appeared. Before then, they would remember I said they were in three categories: elves, beautiful women creatures. Before that, it was dwarfs and elvine, which is elven elves. But in the 14th century, that's when Goblin appeared as an unpleasant nocturnal sprite whose activities overlapped with the puck and such demonic type characteristics. The romances 
continued to feature fair knights coupling with princesses in the forest. The fairy characters gradually became less common and the figures became wizards, witches, entrancesses, etc. such as Morgane Fay in Le Matadiade 1485. Um, she apparently learned her magic through studying and I mean tedious studying and as you know there's other stories how she came about her magic but traditionally that's what it was all about it was all she studied and studied to be magical by the 15th century there was a fairy kingdom and it was formed and it was generated and it was put into varieties of English literature other than romance Scottish romances began to appear and the first to deal with fairyland was one of the most famous of all stories the story of Thomas Rhymer or Thomas of Erseldung dating from 1400 to 1430 I think or 1401 to 1430 this tells of how its hero became the lover of a fairy who took him to her own land sent her through the side of a hill where she turns out to be the wife of its king. He returned to the mortal world with gifts of telling the truth and knowledge of the future. From the mid-15th century comes King Bedok, which the first known usage in Scots of the word fairy, as he was given fairy land and he was a king to the fae, which is not uncommon to be done that. If we go to our Welsh literature, absorbed the actual, the same motif, Butched Colin um, as its saintly hero, and it encountered the traditional Lord of Anwyn, the underworld or otherworldly Gwynanud. Um, Gwyn has now become king of the fairies as well as Owen. And when the saint sprinkles him and is caught with holy water, they all vanish, leaving behind green mounds, it is said. These are writings. By the mid-15th century, the concept of the fairy realm was well known in England. In 1450, <laughs> one calling himself Queen of the Fae operated in Kent and Essex, presumably for profit. The next year, a gang of disguised poachers who raided the Duke of Buckingham's Park in Kent called themselves servants of the Queen of the Fairies. There are cases of women from Somerset and Suffolk who were tried in church courts in the mid and late 15th century for claiming magical powers were said to have been conferred by spirits of the air, which the common people called Fairfry, and in Suffolk, um, there was a one from God and blessed, which was Mary. So, I believe what I was trying to say is that somewhere along the line, they believed that Mary had a child of half fae, half human, sort of, you know, whether that's true or not, who knows. The old tradition of elves that go about inflicting illness on humans continued because the sources would represent this so medical manuals and charms are largely missing from that time so the only thing that they have to go on within those centuries is the bad they don't have anything else to go on the idea that elves or fairies could bestow magical powers on favored humans has always been around too in various forms including powers of healing but it's also probably more ancient than what is written but there were no text so therefore could not be proven either way in the 16th century some well i guess some accounts in, in british 16th century of elf and fairy creatures were made quite a lot the most notable being the appearance of Robin Goodfellow as a particular name for one. First recorded in 1489, Reginald Scott 
in 1584 aligned Robin Goodfellow with household spirits who perform helpful practical tasks in exchange for bread and milk. He also referred to Robin Goodfellow elsewhere that he was a great bull beggar who was feared. I'm not sure what bull beggar actually means. I'm going to have to look at that, aren't I? Because I ain't got a clue what that means. Lord. The classification of fairies and the elementals, by the way, doesn't come till the 16th century. I just want to make make that known. It, it's, it doesn't come till then. Because, just because it was Paracelsus that to fetch those classifications into and if you've ever actually looked at Paracelsus work you'll understand that he put the fae and the spirits in with the alchemical processes and classified them into four categories air the sylphs earth the gnomes fire the salamanders and water the undines and when I say salamanders I do not mean the ones in water these are different the uh, salamanders for fire obviously and it was reformed, it was reformed all over, like late medieval, the concept of fairy kingdom and fairies in general was the sub subject of lots of interest and debates across most of Britain. And fairy mythology became, I think it was from 1560 to 1640, was quite, there was a rise in it then, there was a rise in it because of all the stories. In 1627, the poet Michael Drayton said that some were talking of fairies as if wedded to them. The fairies were involved in many magical practices and operations. Um, this comes about in many scripts of sorcerers from 1560 to 1640 and onwards. Um, there were five that contained directions of invocation and control, how to treat them as a subclass of spirits. And they were rarely, rarely classed as demons in these books. Although they could be hostile, but they were never they were never evil. They were never actually evil. They were never non existent either. Um they were never demonic in those type of writings. That's not what they were. They were completely different. Um they were put about as being quite beautiful creatures that offered quite a lot. The fairy ladies of romances that started way, way back did become more humanised and sophisticated but at the same time out of date. Literature sought new illusions for fairies, um, hobgoblins, brownies, pucks, tiny flower fairies, all that. Beliefs were changed actually due to William Shakespeare Obviously, as you know, Shakespeare has many fae and stuff in his readings, in his writings, etc. in his plays. The perception um, of fairies as being good world creatures was because of him putting them in the play and having them closely related to nothing more than forest dwellers, but representing them more as single figures rather than part of larger groups, A Midsummer Night's Dream promoted that elves were ethereal and diminutive. In 1610, Simon Foreman, watching Macbeth, thought that the witches, as we label them, were fairies or nymphs, and several cases of confidence um, trickery did appear between 1595 and 1614, in which criminals attempted... <laughs> Gosh... <laughs> Um, to part victims from their wealth on the pretense of introducing them to fairy monarchs. Um, what that means is that criminals basically would rob people or would con them out of their money, saying that they would take them to see fairy monarchs, which was never going to happen, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah. And then it was Paracelsus that actually put them into... The right categories. By the 17th century, um, the concept of fairies, it was rewarded 
you know, with the fact that they changed to Little House, Faye, etc. And they were completely, they were very different. Um, it changed so very much over time. There were reported accounts of fairy interaction. Some were documented, but many were, there was many, many, many were lost. And fairies could reward people, but they could also punish people. So they were neither good nor bad. They were just, they just were. 1645, 19-year-old Anne Jeffries from Cornwall was outside knitting when they came over the garden hedge to err six persons of small statue, all clothed in green, which she called fairies, apparently. She was so frightened she fell into a convulsion fit and stopped eating, saying that the fear gave her all she needed. She became quite famous. People flocked to see her from all over the place. She cured by touch, had psychic visions. Of course, local ministers insisted they were evil spirits. So eventually, she was locked up in Bodmin Jail. The preoccupation with fairies remained strong for the rest of the 17th century and into the start of the 18th. Although the volume of recorded interests was much more less and the motifs and ideas did not develop much further which is true they didn't and and did get released from jail eventually but this goes to show what power the ministers did have you know these were just ministers and they actually put her in jail the idea that fairies were evil beings was discussed and sometimes characterized as demonic all throughout times some people group fairies with devils Although still some saw them as very different. Some saw them as ancient because it was an ancient fear of elves and this persisted without reference to Christianity and the Christian theology. And it was an issue in everyday life for them back then. It was something to be careful of every day. It was closely connected to, um, was the belief that fairies could bestow magical abilities on chosen humans. In an early modern period, fairies were the main sources of power for cunning folk. You know, the cunning folk are the witches, the pagans, etc. In the 18th century, there were very few writings about fairies. Although modern English notions of elves became influential in the 18th century Germany, the modern German word elf was introduced as a loan word from the from English in the 1740s, I think. I'm sure it was the 1740s anyway. So, as you can see, things do change through time. There's a lot of changes that, that was made. Um, even when we come to, we're going into the Victorian era next. And even when we get to the Victorian era, there are certain little things that do change throughout this era, but we will get into the Victorian, the you know the 1800s. We'll get into the 19th century, and we'll go into the 20th century. Um, it's important to understand that also. We're going to be looking at a very famous story that is still out there now, one that has been much speculation, I guess, across many platforms. So I'm going to leave it there guys for now as we've got up to the 17th century but we are going to go into the rest on the next part. I just don't want to make it too long because then it takes ages to upload love and light and many blessings.